Once upon a time, we used to listen to each other. Our pain, our joy, our fears, our hopes, and most importantly, our dreams. But somewhere along the way, we got lost and we forgot how to listen. But don't you worry. These stories will have an impact that will help guide you back. Because this is the Rayless Reverie. With the door of her room locked, Viola Perrin opened the letter which she had taken from her husband's office table. It was not very securely glued, and she succeeded in loosening the flap. When she had read it, she dropped the thing upon her dressing table and stared with dry, unseeing eyes into the mirror. Her world had crumbled. She did not burst into tears. She was one of those women who cannot weep. The thing that happened to her left her racked, writhing, tearless. Suddenly the horror of the thing struck her with full force. St. John was untrue. He was intriguing with another woman even while he was being the same courteous, attentive husband to her that he had always been. She rose and clenched her hands fiercely. She caught her lower lip cruelly between her teeth. For the first time in her life, she wanted to scream. In an instant, she was hot with anger and hurt pride. She rose quickly and dressed for the street. She hurried. She must get away. She had no right in this room, in this house, in the house of a man who did not love her. Outside, she walked to the streetcar. She had no plan. She did not intend to go to his office. She was simply getting away from his home. She went to a department store and idly looked at some things without knowing what they were. It was a sale day, and the crowd in the store was immense. She came to herself when a sharp cry sounded at her right, and the throng surged in that direction. A woman had fainted, one of the saleswomen. She was a tall woman, thin and not bad-looking. She had been waiting on Viola the moment before, and she had simply crumbled behind the counter without a word. The cry had come from a cash girl who happened to see her fall. They lifted the woman and carried her limp and pitiful to the elevator, a policeman keeping back the crowd. She left the store and wandered again, aimlessly about the streets. The sidewalks were crowded, mostly with women. It was getting warm, and all the women all looked tired and wilted. Lines of them disappeared into certain doors, and Viola, looking in, saw that these doors were entrances to cheap restaurants. It was the lunch hour, and these women were taking their short recess. The display in the window of one of these places attracted her attention. It contained meats in various stages of preparation and dressing, and a wild assortment of vegetables. Some flies had gotten inside the glass and hovered over the viands. She turned away in disgust. She thought of her own lunch. When she was downtown, St. John always took her to lunch with him at one of the hotels. The white napery, the soft lights, the stealthy-footed waiters, the music, the silver, sprang into her mind in vivid contrast to the cheap display she had just turned from. She shuddered. In the palm room of the Brenton, with the cool, shadowed comfort about her, and an ice before her, the thought of her tragedy returned. She had been evading it all day, putting it away from her, shunning it. But it was always with her, reminding her that her world The life she had lived was shattered. What then? 
she must go away. It would be better to go quietly, without giving any reason. Simply leave. Of course, St. John would understand, as would Myrtle Weiss. But their guilt would seal their tongues. Disappear? And then what? How would she live? What could she do? She was incompetent to teach. She knew nothing about office work. Of course, she could clerk in a store. Suddenly, a vision of what life would mean to her passed deadeningly before her. She remembered the thin, tall woman who had fainted behind the counter without a word. The lines of wilted workers, hastening in their worn clothes to their cheap lunches, rose before her. She shivered. For seven years, she had lived in the lap of luxury. Nothing had been denied her. She had the best of clothes. The best of service, the choices of food, the promptest of attention of every kind. Her home was one of the handsomest houses in the most restricted and stylish residence district of the city. Another thought came to her. No one knew that she had found the letter. The clock in the palm room showed the time to be one thirty. Saint John, she knew, was out of town. She rose quickly and left the room. At the office, Miss Johnson, the stenographer, had just returned from the dairy lunch across the street. She was powdering her rather unattractive nose. Mrs. Perrin smiled at her as she entered her husband's room. Vaguely, she envied this homely creature. The table was undisturbed. Exactly as she had left it, she sealed the letter carefully and replaced it on the top of the little pile of mail upon the blotter.